Well, welcome everybody. This is a uh, really uh, special uh, event and uh, uh, I think uh, initiative that uh, we're, we're hosting here tonight. And I couldn't be more proud that we're hosting it here at the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music. Um, maybe you're going to speak about some of the, uh, the reasons behind this, but uh, I want to uh, uh, first recognize and thank our alum, Rob Reddy, who's one of our first generations here at the New School. And uh, obviously has achieved his own successes and uh, early on saw the need to um, help uh, spread the awareness of these uh, opportunities and resources. I think this was very much uh, seconded by uh, the various individuals who have been in this part of the field of, of resource and grants. So uh, what we hope this would really do is uh, um, introduce a whole uh, new means of supporting and encouraging and perpetuating the creative work of our community. And uh, we're doing this tonight here live, and we're also streaming it, and we're also going to be archiving this. So we really do hope that this is just the beginning of a whole new groundswell of bringing awareness and sort of supporting the how-to for our artistic community, for those who haven't yet uh, seen this as a means to, to their own creative events. So very proud to have this esteemed panel representing some very significant organizations. And uh, we're going to turn this over to our moderator, Rob, and we're going to all enjoy and learn a lot tonight. So thank you all for being here, and we look forward to the dialogue. Thanks, Martin. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be back here at the New School a couple years later. Um, I, had a, I had a really excellent experience here, actually, um, both musically and, and, and personally, and I some of the relationships I've formed here um, are still present in my life today. So I, I'm really grateful for, uh, for the experience I had here as a student um, many years ago. Um, so I'd like to tell you that um, first that the idea for today's panel uh, discussion came out of a similar one that took place uh, back in January at the Jazz Connect panel. Um, and at the end of that, um, all of us here wish that the discussion uh, could have continued. Um, some, of, some of us saying and feeling as though the jazz community seems to not be accessing this world as much as they could, um, which was something that I agreed with. Um, I have a handful of friends and colleagues that, that absolutely do access this world. Um, and, but I do have, I know a lot more that are not, that I'm, constantly encouraging and somewhat pushing to, to get involved in this. Um, so um, I, I think that grant seeking should be a small act, uh, aspect of what any creative, creative artist should be doing and something that can be integrated into our work. Um, the concept of pay, patronage is an age old concept and it is one that jazz artists should be seeing as a mechanism that should be taken advantage of, right? And no matter what form it, it appears in now, you know, and how it's morphed over hundreds of years. Um, so uh, I think there's a, a lot of money out there to be given. And a hope of mine uh, is that through more of us seeking it and properly asking for it, um, we'll perhaps redirect more of it back to us individuals um, with hopefully more and new opportunities uh, rather than it headed towards what I sort of see as the brick and mortar institutions that are receiving what I personally feel as a very, very fair share um, of this money. So um, that's, again, that's just a personal uh, opinion. Yes. So, um, so I see this as your and our jobs to uh, continue to seek these funding opportunities and and that's that's why i'm here and i think that's why these four folks are here with us today um and uh, so i want to uh, again i have personally for all these people but i want to express my sincere gratitude um for for their 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 generosity and the time and the effort that these people are providing uh to us to be here and to hopefully bestow as much useful information as they can on us all right yes <laughs> So um, I'll quickly introduce 
all of our panelists here, their, their, um, their, their bios are on the handout. So if you'd like to know where they're coming from and who, are, who they are and what they do, that their, their bios are in that handout over there. So I will just quickly introduce them. This is Katja von Schuppenbach from the National Endowment for the Arts. That is Jeanette Bocolo from Chamber Music America. Scott Winship from New Music USA. And Maura Brennan from the MAP Fund. Okay, so um, I was thinking about how to uh, how to sort of open this up, and in being here back at the New School, um, something that I thought about is that the professors and the teachers that I learned the most from, or who I thought I accessed the most information from, and, and it became clear to me several years after being here, uh, being a student here, were those who were able to most clearly uh, uh, portray to me what their what their uh, creative process was, um, and some of it I, I I was able to walk away uh, with quite a bit of of that, and some not others. But regardless, it was all um, something that I think through osmosis is is part of uh, part of my process today. So um, so as a creative jazz artist, um, I thought I I'm, I'm a composer and a band leader. And I, I break, I can, I can break my process down into three key, key elements, and that being the creation of my work, the presentation of my work, and the documentation of my work. Um, so I want to open this up to the panelists and start to begin with if, if I was new and fresh to this world and I knew nothing about it and I, and I came to any four of them, uh, where do I go? Who do I look to? Um, who can I turn to? <laughs> um, and, and, and what organizations and programs will best support my work, my projects, and, and, and what, which of those are, are appropriate for what I do? So would anybody like to, uh, to uh, riff on that? Sure. Yeah? Hello. So um, as Rob was saying, I come from uh, the MAP Fund. And just in answer to your question about those three categories that um, how you see your work, um, MAP is squarely in the, the camp of creation, most significantly in creation, and then in presentation to some degree. Um, so does it help if I give a little bit more of a background about MAP, or sure. do they know? Yeah. So MAP uh, has, is 27 years old. It was established in 1989 inside of the Rockefeller Foundation, and it was explicitly established to um, ensure or, or encourage um, national funding dollars from big foundations to go to um, uh, uh, non like established like not to the opera not to the ballet but to work that is less um less established le more on the fringes and uh explicitly at that time interdisciplinary um and jazz certainly fell into the category of uh, the kinds of disciplines that were not getting a big piece of the national funding pie um we give a million dollars away a year roughly a million dollars away a year to about 40 projects um, and it's all, it's an open application system, so anybody can apply, and it's a peer review panel process for selection, so your peers are reading your applications, looking and listening to your work samples, and making decisions about, in any given year, who will be receiving the grant. The priorities for MAP are uh, artistic excellence, viability, and adherence to our goals, which are twofold. The goals are um, work that uh, challenges the conventions of contemporary performance, meaning work that does not fall into a traditional form, work that is formally experimental, and secondarily, work that addresses issues of cultural difference. So anything that has to do with uh, diversity or issues of the other, as we call it, that's where our focus is. So if you are a jazz artist who is creating a work from scratch, who is uh, envisions that work as um, very far outside of what you know the, the sort of formal conventions of jazz are map would be a place that you would want to come and you could do that in the very early stages of your development of that work or you could do that at the presentation stage we don't um, support touring and we don't support documentation thank you thank you 
Um, just to, to speak a little bit about resources, um, I think in where, where you might go, um, uh, Rob did a great job of putting together a list on the handout that's on the table over there of a bunch of resources that are there. Each of our organizations fund heavily fund jazz. Um, and in terms of finding mentors, I mean, I think we're all very approachable. We can talk about where resources are. One thing also is to, to look at who you re respect, who is doing work out there that you respect. Um, and see where they're where they're getting their funding, and help try to try to pick their brains a little bit. When it comes to creation, presentation, and documentation, a lot of these grant programs have different. Uh, they'll they may fund one part of it, not all of it, or different se separate separate things of it. So you might go to one organization for the actual creation part, the, the composition part, and another organization for the recording part of the documentation part, or something like that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's that's precisely where I find myself. But uh, Jeanette, um, your grant in particular I, I, is very unique in the sense that it it actually covers all three of these aspects of the work. Can can you talk about that a little bit? Um, sure, would love to. Um, when Rob says your grant, he's referring not to my grant. Right. But <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, and not to my organization, but it's Chamber Music America. And it's the new Jazz Works grant, which is open to small jazz ensembles. We particularly have a focus on small jazz, two to 10 musicians. Rob Reddy is a former grantee. Mr. Owens, who's in the audience, was one of the uh, founding fathers, in a way, of the program um, in, when it was first started in 1999. And what Rob was saying as a three uh, three stage or three different parts of a grant program. If you're a band leader or a co-leader and you're looking for money to create a new work for an ensemble that's based in the United States, it's a jazz ensemble, two to 10 musicians, you can get between like 20 to $34,000 depending on the size of your band for three years to, to compose the work to premiere the work, to tour the work, and to document the work. That's one of the grand programs that CMA offers to the jazz field, small ensemble jazz field. And um, it's nice to also kind of understand how we are, we represent different pieces of a puzzle, of a funding puzzle, whereas New Music America, USA. New Music USA funds music. We fund jazz, small ensemble. We also fund Euro classical and world small ensemble music. Sometimes the big question like Maura and I were talking about is what's jazz and what's new music and what's work, you know? So, so that's, thank you. And if there's any initial thing that I would like to say in support of Rob and Martin getting us here is that, um, we are here to encourage you to come to the grant process. That's our job. That's, that's why we do what we do, because there is this money and we want you to understand what the steps are and then you determine if it's the right thing for you and then we help you figure out how to make the application and walk through the process. So we say, go for it. That's a that's a great point. Yes, we definitely want you to get funding for what you're doing, and I do also, Rob, want to point out point out that um, New Music USA does have a grant program called Project Grants that also funds all three elements. Uh, you can either come at apply for one element or all three together. Uh, we have money that is specifically set aside for. Uh, creation of new work and recording, but we also fund uh, performer fees and performances as well. So it's called Project Grants. We just had a deadline yesterday. We'll have another one in the fall. We have twice uh, one dead, we have a deadline twice a year. Um, and right now we're funding about 25% jazz, or we're actually we're, we're receiving about 25% jazz, trying to fund around the same percentage, um, but we'd like to see more. Uh, we get a, we have a very diverse range of music that comes in the door, and as you're saying, it's starting to kind of blur between what is genre and what, what isn't, but we certainly want to give you uh, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I have to say, as, a, as someone who's been involved in this process for many years, um, I've always found people at uh, these 
for institutions of uh, definitely and uh, and all the other institutions extremely willing to help and uh, and uh, help you through the process um, as, as as best I can. Katya, would you like to talk about yes. process at the NEA? So the National Endowment for the Arts is an independent agency of the federal government and was established by Congress in 1965. And since that time has uh, given away about $5 billion, more than $5 billion to support the arts in the United States. Now, since 1996, the time of the culture wars, we no longer make grants to individual artists. We uh, fund qualified 501c3 organizations that have a three-year programming history at a minimum in the discipline that the organization chooses to apply in. So jazz at the NEA is um, somebody who is a jazz artist or an organization that supports jazz would apply in music and um, which eliminates questions about um, is it you know jazz or is a crossover we have uh, lots of hybrid projects now that we get and we also have hip-hop projects for example that um, get funded so don't shy away if you um, you know if an organization does something unusual they're always welcome our main funding program now is artworks and we have two deadlines a year so a qualified organization may either come in in February or in July and we support um, creation projects that's commissions and um, engagements, premieres and performances of works, touring, for example, festivals can apply. Then we also offer opportunities for organizations who focus on learning. So that could be um, service organizations can apply, for example, to the Arts Endowment for professional and artistic development, lifelong learning, um, touring projects. So there's a whole bunch of um, different types of projects that we look for um, for getting applications in and i'm also like the three of you very willing to talk to individual artists sometimes i cannot do more than refer them to you which i'm also delighted to do and other times what i suggest is um, we don't accept applications either from fiscal sponsor organizations and i know there are several in the field of music and but what an artist can do is look for a 501c3 organization in the field that is um, qualified to, to um, apply to the arts endowment and approach them and see if the project that, you, that the artist wants to work on is something that the organization would like to take in. And then you would collaborate with that organization. The organization would apply to the arts endowment for funding and you could do it that way. So sometimes that's music department of schools. Sometimes, for example, there's a lot of jazz societies with 501c3 status in the United States who might be delighted actually to work with an artist on a special project. There is, um, in touring, there's the Western Jazz Presenters Network that sponsors tours for individual up and coming artists, established artists through the Western states. So that's a nonprofit organization that can apply for the arts endowment. But, um, and the other thing to know is also that traditional jazz, for example, the applications a lot of times don't come in the music, but in the folk and traditional arts discipline. And the same goes for blues. Great, all right. Thank you. You had something to say, Jeanette, Ted? Yes. Um, uh, uh, Chamber Music America, the the what we call um, uh, the the jazz program, the jazz portfolio of grants is made possible by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and um, Mora, as the program, the Map Fund is also funded by the Doris Duke program, and the Mid Atlantic Arts Foundation, who, an organization that has a regional name but actually services the country and has its jazz programs, it is also funded by the Doris Duke Charitable. So we who work at these organizations are, are getting to know each other and the programs that we each individually administer. So uh, we just wanna say thank you to Doris Duke and, um, and, uh, and thank you.
just a quick follow-up on that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, it's absolutely. So while MAP was established inside of the Rockefeller Foundation in 2007, we ceased being funded by Rockefeller, and we started being funded by Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. What's interesting for us about that is that Duke uh, has a pretty, their definition of jazz isn't so restrictive, but they only fund jazz in the music category. So if somebody comes to MAP like with an opera project, um, I have to use the Mellon money to, to support those projects and uh, only can use the Duke money to do the jazz projects, uh, which I think we'll get into later about how the definition of jazz and those of you who are working in hybrid projects and the complications of all that. But just to say that Duke does amazing work in funding arts in general, and they have a very specific focus on jazz and are very interested in developing the number of jazz grantees that they that they serve. And, and I would like to add something that 60%, 40% um, of the funding that the Arts Endowment receives from Congress each year, right off the bat goes to the regional and jurisdictional arts agencies and, um, and st yeah, states arts agencies. And one of the, there are five regional arts agencies in the United States and one of them is Mid-Atlantic Arts. Uh, not Mid-Atlantic Arts does a lot for jazz and then, um, it's actually Mid-Atlantic Arts does the most of the five for jazz. So if an artist calls me, for example, an, an individual artist not affiliated with a 501c3 organization, sometimes, um, especially if they call me from um, smaller cities or um, from across the country, I ask them if they already had contacted their state, local, or regional arts agencies. Because unlike the arts endowment, there might be funding for individual artists. So, um, and they also, they call um, their funding category, the money that comes from the arts endowment is also considered artworks. So it's not administered through us, but through other agencies on our behalf. And there might be opportunities available for our individual artists. Hmm. Okay, um, thank you for that. So. So I want to bring it back to the focus um, of the individual and where we're at in, in, in this process. So we have a, uh, a project in mind um, that we would like to seek funding for, right? And we, we find an organization or, uh, and its grant that is most fitting and appropriate for, to fund that, that particular project. Yes? Um, what I'd like to ask next, at when that when I'm at that point, and I, I feel that it's appropriate to to approach an organization and and, and apply for this grant, um, I would like to ask the panelists, how how do I how do I best express what my project is about, to make to uh, more properly define the goals of what you fund, with without altering what I do. Um, you know, to, to make it most compelling to, to the people that you choose as panelists, to, to define it as clearly as possible, and, uh, and, and perhaps it, it, it being a successful project that could be funded. Uh, one of the best ways to do that initially, um, you, found, you found an organization that you think resonates with what you do and, and what you're hoping to do. Uh, very carefully read their guidelines and look at their criteria. The review criteria is very informative. Sometimes it can seem vague and, and not so specific, but th that's really what they're going to be evaluating your project on is the review criteria. Mm -hmm. And um, the more you can understand what they're trying to get at through that review criteria is really important. So the next step, you understand, you see what the review criteria is. Make sure you understand what the mission of the organization is as well. What are they trying to fund? Um, how does that relate to the criteria for this project? Or, or maybe the project, I mean, the program itself has a specific focus. So you want to you wanna figure out whether or not that's the right fit for you and then and sort of talk about it in ways that, that make sense for that panel. Because, you know, panel, uh, at least our program and, and my colleagues' programs are all are panel, panel driven. And we don't make the decisions. I don't make the decision. Uh, we hire uh, colleagues, our colleagues in the field, and your peers to look over a number of applications and evaluate them. And so what they're given is a set of instructions and a criteria and a, and a mandate or a, a, you know instructions, at least from the organization, to, to fund the best work that they can within those criteria. So they're, they're often uh, looking at a lot of different projects, and they're always coming back to that criteria. So you really want to understand that criteria. And if you have questions about it, reach out to the organization specifically about, like, say, well, 
what do you mean? So for instance, in Music USA, we have three criteria that can be very vague. The first is artistic merit, that, which is understandable. The second is impact, and the third is capacity. So the first and the last, relatively clear. The third one, I mean, the middle one, impact, can, can take a lot of different forms. And, and it's meant to be somewhat vague because we get a lot of different types of projects. And the impact can be, you know, it could be uh, on you, the, the composer or the performer, or it could be on the, or the organization, having you as a performer. It could be on the community. What's the impact there? So I wouldn't, you know, if you're not clear on how you want to tackle that, talk to me with respect to your project. And we say, well, this, you know, what do you think? You know, we can work through that. But it's very important to look at the criteria, understand the criteria, and in, in, in how that relates to the organization and the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing that I've found very helpful over the years is to look at list of past grantees. Thank you. That's a very good point. I was right. going to, yeah. Yeah, because you, you can, uh, you know, you, you can sort of understand where you're coming from and, and who you're sort of related to and, and, and what your work kind of looks and smells like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and if, if there's no one there that you sort of recognize as sort of being closely related in your circles, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's not the right place. Um, if you're starting to see names that make sense to you, that people you've either worked with um, or your work is in sort of, you know, sort of in the sort of in the similar plane, then uh, then then you might be at the in the, in the right place. Yeah, we all publish. We all publish lists of our awardees. Um, New Music USA also um, makes it very public our awardees. We have a project gallery where um, you can go and, and look at the projects that were awarded and uh, you can you can. Uh, filter by jazz and look at all the other jazz projects that are there. So that might help, you know, help tailor. The same goes for the arts endowment. All applications that come in are reviewed by expert panels, panels of peers. Um, the staff does not have any input. Our task is to guide the applicant um, to make the right decision in terms of the deadline they apply under because we accept different types of projects in February than we do in July. And you want to be very sure that your application will be reviewed by the most appropriate panel. Then um, right off the bat, we ask the applicants also to um, select an outcome or goal for the application. So depending on whether, they, whether you choose creation, engagement, or learning, um, you have to make sure that your application is tailored to that outcome because you don't want to create any questions that the panel cannot answer because they cannot contact you. And all applications that come into the Arts Endowment are reviewed against artistic excellence and artistic merit. And so each of the two overarching criteria, there's a lot of bullet points, um, what exactly that means. So we are very specific. It's not that all the criteria apply all the time, but um, I suggest when the narrative is created for the application to look at the eva evaluation criteria, to see yourself already um, the way the panelist would later on look at your application so that you because they will get the same criteria so there is no, no, no secret there it's always artistic excellence and artistic merit and we are there to, to guide you through when you apply and um, I always say it's almost like a press release or like a business card you don't have too much space really to describe your project you have to be very concise you have to be um, very accurate, and you really have to know what your project is. It has to be very, very well defined to make sense. Samantha, do you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I like to say that you need to be an educated shopper because you kind of shop around for grants, right? And, you know, when you would and if you still, which we hope you do, get gigs from venues, you know so-and-so runs this place and they're into this and so-and-so runs that place. So you've got a whole database of information about venues that you've cultivated over the years. So too, you need to develop this database of funders, right? And in simplifying it, I say, if you want to make oranges, or if you want to bar, buy an orange, you go to a shop that sells oranges. You don't go to a shop that sells string beans, right? And it's, it's very simple. It's perhaps too simple, 
But if you can keep it simple, then you make your work more economical. You don't get frustrated by coming to CMA and saying, why don't you fund the projects that I have 11 musicians? It's just one more musician. Why can't you deal with that? Because we're mandated to deal with two to 10, right? And it's as simple as that. I can't help you with that extra musician. It's not that I wouldn't like to, that we wouldn't like to, but we can't, right? So don't frustrate yourself and hit us up for what we can help you with, right? That's where you become an educated shopper. The other thing I'd like to break apart a little bit or deconstruct what Rob was saying, and excuse me if I didn't hear it right, sure. right? Because some of the questions that Rob is asking us he could actually tell us about what is his experience of applying when he looks at the CMA guidelines and he has to answer a question because he's done it a number of times, right? But there's one thing I wanted to focus on a little bit. When you said, you know, you got a project and when you're dealing with the organization and you know you have to change it up a little bit so that it fits into what the organization right. wants. That, right. Well, I, I, my question is, how do I, how do, how do I, most clearly express what my project is about without, without compromising? Without compromising. My, That's the big work. issue. Compromising. Which I've never. Do had, I have so. to <laughs> compromise myself in asking for money? Because that's a big thing. That's a big thing to get through, to work through. But what I'd like to say there, and I'm sure we all feel this way, is to be true to yourself, to be authentic. The truth speaks in your words. You don't need a grant writer many times to apply to our grant programs. I know there might be some programs that are more sophisticated. And it's almost better not to, um, uh, grant writers are wonderful people and they have great skills, but like Katja was saying, it's musicians like yourself who sit on the panel. So what I say is use words that another musician will think is real. You describe your project as if you're talking to a friend of yours. You're not talking to an administrators like us. You don't have to use big fancy, if you want to, you're welcome to, but you have to talk music in words. You have to talk your idea in words. If it's an organization that is asking for a project description. Not all organizations do. This year, CMA changed up a little bit, which is a point that I want to bring up, is that we often, I often hear this, and you guys probably hear it too. Well, five years ago when I applied and didn't get the grant, it was required this. And we have to say, well, five years ago isn't 2015 anymore because five years ago things changed. These grant programs evolve or change dramatically or are replaced by other grant programs. So if you're still thinking of a Model T Ford and we're you know, driving a Mazda, you're a little bit behind the time, right? And so the big thing is and that gets back to like being an educated shopper, stay current. Uh, you know, and what you don't understand after reading the guidelines and looking through the application, then ask us about it. Yeah, yeah and I, I'd like to um, reiterate some points or at least highlight some thoughts is like uh, the audience that you're talking to it, are your peers. So use your peers. I mean, you have peers. Ask them to look it over. Give them the set of criteria. Have them look through it and have them review your project along those same criteria. They may not. I mean, I don't know. That is another set of eyes. It takes it out of your your uh, your own head. It takes it into somebody else's head, and they're charged with looking at it in a different perspective. If you can do that yourself as well, take yourself out of it and look at it uh, objectively. That's very helpful. But use your friends. I mean, it, I think it's a very very useful thing. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. For applications to the arts endowment, it, it may make sense sometimes to have a grant writer. Um, I want to come up with a scenario. For example, a, a music department of a major university wants to have you as an artist in residence. The music department itself cannot apply to the arts endowment. Schools usually have sponsored program offices 
with one or several grants officers who file applications. So since with the arts endowment, there is a one application per institution per year rule, you have to make sure that not maybe the dance or theater department already has an application in with the arts endowment or is planning to do so. So that would be an issue, for example. But the sponsored programs office of a, of a school can take away um, all the requirements from you to come up with fiscal information for the school, which the music department likely doesn't even have. Sometimes they negotiated cost rates uh, with the federal government for large institutions. And um, there's also information needed about the background of the organization. So those are all things that the sponsored programs office can assist with. What they do not have is the expertise in the field. So for you as an artist and whoever you work with with the music department, you need to create the um, write-up for the project itself. Define it so well that even a um, grant specialist at that sponsored programs office who doesn't know anything about jazz is able to put it in the template for the application and submit it successfully to the arts endowment. So I think that the individual so that they will support an application to the Arts Endowment. And um, then you are ready to go. There shouldn't be any typos. There shouldn't be any spelling um, errors of you know, fellow musicians' names that somebody else who is a grant specialist but not a musician could not correct because they just wouldn't know. So it's important to be thorough. It's important to be able to define your project well, also for non-musicians. And then one more thing. Since the Arts Endowment is giving away federal tax dollars, impact is um, pretty well defined. Why should federal tax dollars be spent on my project and why now? So a project that only would draw in an audience that the school already has access to, which is teaching staff, um, students from the music department and from the school, um, that would be a project that could be with the arts endowment applications perceived as being insular, even if it's a great project. So a community engagement component is always very important. That could be reaching out into schools, high schools in the area that would be drawn in, that are normally not affiliated with the school, or um, audiences from the neighborhood that usually would not come in. But you have to make your case also why your project is worthy of um, federal tax funding. Dollar funding. Rob, could I just jump in? Sure. Please. Um, we're talking about music, so the work sample. That was that was where I was going next. <laughs> the work sample is extremely important, and as Katja was suggesting, is um, you know y your input into the works. If it's if it's you're applying for the grant, of course you're going to take the care that's needed to make a really strong work sample. And, um, but if you're involved in an organization that may not be a school, but may be a performing arts center in the, in the country, and they're putting together an application to invite your ensemble to perform there or to do a residency there, I urge you, we urge you to get involved in the creation of that work sample because the people you know, many times the uh, the jury process is first about listening to the audio work sample. And if you don't make it through that phase, then you don't get to look at the written application. The processes are all different. But uh, you can tell a work sample that was put together by someone who doesn't know music. And then that works against the application. So for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that's where I was headed next um, in, in this sort of process. So that we're, we're, at, we're at finding a, a grant in an organization that makes sense for our work, right? Um, uh, and then uh, expressing what our project is about and why it makes sense to this organization. And I was going to go next to work samples. 
um, and I've spoken about this before with the panelists. Um, when I began this process somewhere in the late 90s, a work sample for me was uh, purely an audio sample, a recording of my music, and perhaps uh, a score, uh, a score to accompany that music. Um, that, that has changed dramatically over the years. Um, and uh, work samples now are uh, sort of, uh, there's work samples in every shape and form uh, possible. Um, uh, and for me, uh, I had to play some catch up. You know, I had to, um, I had to uh, access uh, some other formats and things that I had never before in terms of, of creating good, uh, uh, good uh, work samples that, that I felt would uh, show my work clearly and, and express what I'm trying to do. And something that seemed of uh, particularly at least decent quality um, because uh, I, I wanted to be competitive to the hundreds of other applications that are, that are being submitted. So can we can we uh, can we talk about how how work samples are seen either through your eyes and as the panelists as well? Sure. Um, so it of course depends on the nature of the project that you're submitting for. If it's a um, if it's a, comp a commission for a composition um, for Map Anyway, we invite you to submit a recording. Um, you upload a, a MP4 or whatever. Um, if it's a if it's a project that includes more than one discipline, we encourage you to also submit some video that may allow the panel to kind of experience the, you know, the immersive uh, experience of seeing the work. Um, in the case of MAP, you know, you can have up to three lead artists on a project. So if you're doing an interdisciplinary project or a hybrid project, you'll submit a work sample for, say, the composer. You'll submit a work sample for for example, the choreographer, and then for maybe the director. Um, you may also submit for a project that's, again, just a composition, in which case you would just submit um, the audio sample. In terms of the nature and quality of the sample, so for audio, obviously, it's going to be a group of your peers listening to this, so it's got to be a high-quality audio. They're, it has to, they're going to have very sensitive ears to what's going on in the music, so you need to allow them to hear everything that's going on in the music. That's exactly what they're judging, basically. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm so, music is my, um, I, I am least educated in music, quite frankly. So um, I, I know a lot more about theater and dance, and I can say in the video samples for theater and dance, we very much encourage artists to begin the video at a place where it sort of pops in one way or another, that, you know, the eye is caught immediately. And sometimes artists push against that because, well, I'm making durational work and it really is about the culmination of this whole thing. And I entirely sympathize with that. But in a panel scenario, they're seeing, you know, they're looking at a hundred work samples over a short period of time. So you have to, you have to just kind of swallow your sense of maybe what the arc of the work is and really just capture their attention very immediately. It's a very different skill than the skill of creating that work that you're demonstrating, right? So uh, because I don't know s so much about music as uh, I would say, I can't, I don't want to advise on that. My guess is it would be something similar. Like you don't want to start at the really quiet early part of the of the piece and let it crescendo, you know, like you want to get in a little. Definitely don't start when there's applause coming on stage. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't do that. Don't, that's, that's just you know, wasting time. Right. So, but yeah. So, so similarly, you probably want to try as objectively as you can to find the segment of your work that is going to be the most thrilling, the most compelling to an uninitiated listener. Um, sometimes that can be really hard to do from the perspective of you, the creator, which is why I very strongly encourage you, like the project description, to hand it off to somebody else. Give it to somebody. I, I always suggest two things. Give it to somebody who knows your work well and give it to somebody who doesn't know your work at all and get the feedback from them in terms of what they are experiencing when they have that sample. You want, you're going to encounter both of those scenarios in the panel. Some artists will know, some panelists will know you, some will not, and you want to be able to speak to them both. Yeah, a few a few thoughts. Sorry, Robbie. yes, no, please, Scott, your process. Uh, well, and not so much our process, but um, everything you said is great. Um, and a few other things to think about. Um, we always encourage people to to include 
recent work samples, work samples that demonstrate your most recent work. Um, if you're applying for something that is the creation of new work and you're submitting a sample from 20 years ago, that may not be where you are now in your creative process. So the panel is not going to know really what to do with that. So definitely submit recent work of high quality. Um, provide media that's relevant. Media that's relevant to your project. Uh, also, if you're, you know, depending on what your project is, what you're applying for, pro provide work samples that relate to what you're re requesting funds for. Um, if it's for a large ensemble work, if you say you, you want to write a big band piece, um, but you submit uh, a trio, that may not give the panel enough context of how you work with a large ensemble. Something like that. Um, as as uh, as we were just saying, is like provide intelligent or smart starting points. I mean, like you, you really do need to think about this. There, the panel's time to evaluate work samples, sadly, 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 is way less than you think it is. Whatever you think they're gonna do, it's probably less. A quarter, of what you think yeah. a quarter of what you think they're gonna do is what they're actually yeah. gonna have time so to do. So we, with all due sym sympathies for our long form composers and long form musicians, do try to find a, a point where they can really grasp what you're after. You know, you can provide the whole work if they're really taken with it. They'll listen to the whole work and want to see how it develops. But most panelists have very short amount of time to to process these work samples. They have to go through them very quickly and make decisions um, based on what you give them. So do think about it very carefully. Um, moments of silence, moments of applause, uh, credits. Don't provide work samples that are. Um, I mean, at least for us, we don't we don't like work samples that are uh, demonstrations of various different works put together, like one work sample that's like a mashup of all your different things, provide one work sample that's a piece, or if in, definitely look at what the, the organizations are asking for. We don't specify excerpts uh, or others. We ask for cues primarily, but some organizations only ask for S excerpts, uh, but we do prefer to have cues um, as well. In other words, you would submit the whole work and just provide the cue points yeah. rather than just submitting the five minutes or something. I think that's that's some basic basic thoughts. Um, to riff off of the colleagues to the right, um, uh, I had a whole list of things to talk to you about. Um, when you talk about a short amount of time for CMA your new jazz works grant is basically going to be evaluated on up to five minutes of listening of your two ensemble tracks you give them 10 minutes of music they listen to about five and they make a decision on those five minutes two and a half of the first track two and a half of the second that's, to me, even smaller than a quarter. <laughs> and you know something? It works, believe it or not. You start to understand if you're sequestered in this room for three days with five musicians, and you're one of them. And you, in our case, it's only a number. They do not know that it's the Jeanette Fuokolo XT band, right? You know. Uh, they only know it by a number of that your application has arrived. So sometimes they pass up jazz greats. Uh, and sometimes they select complete unknowns to move to the next level. And then you get reviewed on your composer tracks. And again, it's just two and a half minutes, two and a half minutes because we, they're already spending five days out of a week reviewing all these applications, making the determination, working from nine to five or nine to six. That's how long it takes for us to get through. So um, uh, understand that you it's, it's competitive. You know it's competitive, but you don't wanna think about it when you're, like Maura was saying, you don't want to, um, uh, you want to give the long form and no it's competitive and you need to be strategic you need to make it worth your effort in applying so give them the really strong work sample and we do say Maura hit right away and no matter how many times we say no applause no announcement 
you'd be surprised how many people give us the applause, the announcement. And you wonder why, what do we have to say to encourage you to understand those 30 seconds are your wasted time to get to your music, right? And um, if I like to say is if you're thinking of applying to a new Jazzworks grant, there's two things you need to invest in besides, um, in our case, a membership fee, but um, is, that the most important thing is your work sample. So if you're thinking of meeting the next March deadline, think now of what you're going to record and how you're going to record it. Either is it going to be a live recording? Or are you going to go into the studio with the band that you want to make the proposal? Think now of what you want to do in terms of the recording. Do your recording first before you do your written uh, application. And the second thing is Rob talked about it and you might have missed what he was saying, but it's true. And I'm not gonna speak, I don't mean to bring up an age difference, but younger artists know how to edit, know how to put it and know that, and some of the artists who have been uh, playing for a while have to go and find and learn some of the programs that, you know, that m allow you to come up with what CMA requires. And the last thing I want to say is next year, CMA is going to be moving to an online application, which will be new for us. We do know that some of our colleagues have already advanced on that level. So that will be a new learning curve for all of us. The, the Arts Endowment has very clearly defined guidelines for the work samples in music. So I will not go on detail into detail because it also depends on whether you apply for um, a commission for a creation project for uh, performances of excellent works or for a touring project. So, but what we like to see is the applicants call us, look at the requirements for the type of projects that you want to apply for. And if you have any questions, call me before you make your decisions. For example, there are sometimes um, tribute projects by orchestras for a specific purpose where uh, most of the musicians may never have performed together. So there is obviously no existing work sample that could be submitted, but there is the best kind of work sample that could be submitted um, instead. Uh, for example, the most recent recording of two of the artists in that orchestra that have performed together. And then obviously an explanation why no other work samples can be provided. But we are after work samples. We, can, we have um, a rule 30 minute total for the work samples for audio and video. And um, it's up to the applicant to choose which they would pref which they prefer. We also need a support letter. If it's a recording project from the record label, or if it's a commission project from the organization who's also sponsoring the commission or from the artist himself. So that all depends, but um, it's very important that you choose the best work samples you have. And it's um, pretty much understood that commercial recordings that, no older, that are no older than two years might be difficult to come by, difficult to come by because there is not that many commercial recordings anymore. So what would you use instead? Um, a live performance that's taped, um, a most recent one, for example, that is um, unedited. So a couple minutes of that would be good, but it has to be a very good performance. So sometimes there's fabulous musicians and you would think it would be not a problem to come up with a good work sample. But if it's somebody who's not a musician who is making the decision, you're right there, they may, um, select that one recording that should have never made it um, to be part of that application. So, but we love to discuss it and we also go into detail concerning the um, file formats that are acceptable. We have a system, it's called NEA Go. And so all work samples get uploaded in there. One of the quirks is variable bit rates that system cannot deal with. So it will sound good when you listen to it on your own computer, but if you don't listen back after you uploaded it, you will never know. And when I listen to it, which I do, we have to check all the work samples that come in before they go to panel, it will sound like an underwater recording and that obviously doesn't do any good. But we're, we're delighted to talk to anybody about that. I just wanna add one more thing, Rob. 
uh, on on work samples um, in artistry in general. It's obviously uh, you know by nature a matter of interpretation. Uh, we provide some questions. We throw them out there, just like things to think about and what you might want to think about as well when you're trying to choose between a work sample or uh, charging your friends or thinking about it yourself. Think about a few things. Um, does this work compel your interest? Does it make you want to keep listening or watching if it's a video? Uh, does it embody a distinctive and authentic artistic voice? Uh, does the work feel fresh or is it derivative? And we get a lot of that. Sometimes the panels feel that the work isn't as fresh as they, they might like. Uh, does the work show highly developed craft or technical excellence? So these are some things you should be try to be self-evaluative, self-critical. Think about the work samples when you're when you're making choices. It's a very important thing. Work samples are number one, probably all of our grant programs. The number one uh, most important thing you should be thinking about are, are the choice of work samples that you throw in. Also, we allow to submit links, hyperlinks. And if you have something uploaded on YouTube, uh, you have to take into consideration that it will take several months from the point when you submit your application until the panel will actually look at them. And if at that point in time, the live link is not working anymore, then you lost a work sample opportunity right there. So that's something to keep in mind for sure. Thank you. We have the same same issue with our with our grant program as um, they're all embeddable links, either from YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, although you can upload an MP3 or some other other uh, medias. But if you are if you are hosting material for a work sample, make sure that it's available the whole time. We run in this, into this a lot. If it's password protected, send us a password, that sort of thing. So often does this happen where panels like, well, I can't access this work sample. There's a lost opportunity. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I want to touch upon, uh, uh, I want to ask one more question of our panelists and then uh, open, open this to uh, Q and A with, I'm, I'm so sure some of you folks have some questions for us. Um, I would like to ask, um, I, so I've operated myself as an individual, as a sole proprietor, um, since I began this process in the mid nineties and with, with relative, you know, with decent success and I've funded a fair amount of my projects that I, that I sought funding for. Um, just within the last uh, couple months or so, I formed my own 501c3, my own arts organization. Um, can we discuss the advantages of using a dedicated non-for-profit 501? Um, it seems to me that, you know, dance companies, theater companies, classical composers, classical ensembles um, operate with 501c3 and that the jazz world is sort of late to coming to the 501 process. And, um, I found it a, an extremely easy process, um, and I feel as though it, it it expands the range of opportunities that I'm going to be able to uh, access now. I would disagree with that entirely. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Which no, part of it? Sorry. Um, I think that uh, the trend is moving away from a step. Of, I mean, if certainly there are certain grants that you're not going to be able to get if you're not a 501c3. For example, the NEA, not even if you are associated with a fiscal sponsor. You just have to be that 501c3 entity. And that's how you access that money. However, it seems to me that um, many, many grant programs are opening, especially the newer grant programs are opening themselves up to the fiscal sponsor situation and even more. So what we see in the field, and you guys can concur or not, is that uh, artists are tending to work inside of institutions less and less. They're even tending to think of themselves as like an organization less and less. They're an independent entity that, you know, kind of has an orbit of other artists that they work with and, you know, for one project, they may work with this group of people. For another, they may work with this group. That seems to be how people are thinking about making work in the field right now. And so the idea of establishing a company or an entity um, is a little bit um, is a little bit top heavy. And it may just weigh you down in a way that um, ultimately, you know, it, it requires. Do you have a board for your organization? I do. Right. I had so, to, yeah. yeah. So, right. So, um, you know, you end up having to deal with a board, you end up having to deal with paperwork and potentially even a staff, all of those things that may actually further hinder you from making the, getting the time to make your work. That's what I'm seeing in terms okay. of the trend. It does, it, do, it does mean if you choose not to go that route that you will be excluded from certain grant opportunities. Right. How many opportunities um, from our organizations here um, are accessible without a 501? And uh, how many beyond that uh, so, so if there's a number there, then how many beyond that 
are are accessible with one. Well, uh, our organization, you can apply as an individual. Right. There, there aren't there aren't a lot of organizations that you can still apply with an individual that I know of, but maybe you know of more than I do. Um, well, so MAP, I mean, you have to get uh, you have to go, come through a fiscal sponsor. Yeah, we, we don't even require a fiscal sponsor. Right. But um, I think we're an anomaly in that way. There are organizations that require a fiscal sponsor or a 501c3, some sort of umbrella. But I mean, there might be more that there are out there that I'm unaware of. Chamber Music America too is one where the individual artist comes directly to the individual artist is the band leader is conceptually the ensemble led by the band leader or a project leader. Mm -hmm. So you do not need a fiscal agent. You do not need a nonprofit. And um, I, you know, more, I was thinking of Ralph Lemon, the choreographer who years ago disbanded his organization and acted more independently. You see that in the dance choreography world. Rob, you were probably hitting upon something that uh, might uh, might make sense, which is that maybe jazz artists are opting to enter into the nonprofit world more so for the first time and taking the lead there, whereas other disciplines have been doing it for a long time and might be moving away from it. There is a thing that you have to be concerned about, like with the Martha Graham company, where who owns the work? Right. And and there is a whole organizational aspect to it. And and I would like to point out Future of Music Organization, which is an extremely right. brilliant organization. They have this this report and this project called 42 Revenue Streams for Musicians, where you can go look where they've researched um, jazz artists and um, classical musicians and rock and independent musicians to see. And they've determined 42 different revenue streams. And I think that's very informative, you know, where they see things like moving towards teaching in the university college setting. But, you know, creating a nonprofit might be another source or a supposed source of revenue. You just have to see if it's worth your while, right? And um, I, as a representative of the federal government, cannot give any guidance on that. I have no opinion. We would say, well, you have to speak to your tax advisor on that to see if it makes sense for you. Um, but there is one exception at the Arts Endowment actually um, concerning the ability of um, individual artists to apply for funding, and that it's in literature. So literature fellowships, um, fiction, nonfiction, and poetry is open to individual artists, no 501c3 required. I agree with you, Maria, that, that it seems like more organizations that we work with uh, in terms of the more classical um, experimental cross-disciplinary stuff, maybe not venturing into the, the nonprofit world as much, but I, I, th I think it, it's it's a personal choice. Depends on what you're looking, where you're at in your career, what, what kinds of funding you're looking for, because there are certain organizations where you just have to have that kind of infrastructure. Say if you're applying to NISCA or some other organizations, you need right. to have that kind of infrastructure in order to, to even uh, come to the door. Exactly. I've seen, um, although I've uh, had projects funded and, and, and like I talked about the three stages before about the creation and the and the presentation and documentation to uh, um, I've certainly seen opportunities where I could have had increased performance and educational opportunities had I had a 501 intact where I didn't before. So that's, that's what that if, my... I, if I might add to this is that because I've worked in a lot of different disciplines in the past is like the jazz world is an economy is a marketplace in the United States of into of itself. And like, if you were to look at the dance world or the, um, you know, not the Rockettes, but the, the, uh, the create, um, the, what? <laughs> the, uh, the, the dance world as, uh, um, or, uh, yes. And if you, um, if you, each of those fields, the dance, the theater, um, the video, they have their own lifespan. And the jazz world is really interesting now because it's it's kind of blossoming in a different way. And so it's like car sales is different than charcoal. You know, jazz is different than dance. Mm -hmm. And you folks come to it, you as artists come to it now and you infuse it with a, a certain kind of energy 
because you see certain aspects of the field drying up and you see certain potentials developing and you say, okay, let me see what's happening there. That is its own, uh, its own rhythm, its own, its own organ. The jazz is its own organism. And it's very interesting to think of it in like, where is the money to be made? What's, you know, what's possible there? So, um, and then how, jazz like so for many of you function in the world of music and jazz is maybe one aspect of what you call your music you know so um so and and uh and uh, new music usa represents that music that larger music discussion so it's very there's a lot of different discussions within the world of music making so and, and there's certainly projects, um, cross-fertilization, genre bending, whatever terms you want to use, where um, like Imani wins, I think they might have a 501c3 um, project with um, Wayne Shorter, for example. So that's something Imani Wynn could come, could, could come in and apply for funding for a project with a jazz musician, as could classical orchestras, which do that, you know like featuring Branford Marsalis or so. Mm -hmm. I am talking about that, the, the jazz music, and I'm putting my fingers up in quotes, business that is out there. I'm, I'm seeking complete independence from that, that standard music business. That's interesting. Right. I'd love to hear you say more about that. I, I also... Sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. No, I just eager to hear from the audience as well. I want to make sure yeah, we have I, enough time. I, yeah, it's time. I want to, um, I certainly want to open it up to some questions. So I will, uh, Join you out there. And also, uh, we have a virtual audience as well. So of those who might be tuning in on our Google Hangout, uh, if you have a question, type it in, certainly, and uh, we'll do our best to address them as well. Uh, Thank you, Scott. Anybody? Come over. Yes, just introduce yourself. And, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Rory Stewart. And uh, thank you to Meet the Composer for a couple of small grants in the early 80s. Thank you to the National Endowment for a 1992 grant before you stop giving them to individuals. So those are great. And, and you know, I think the thing that Maura was saying corresponds to my perception of the actual way things work. But when I look at grants, and I haven't even been applying for a while, it seems to me that it doesn't necessarily fit that model. It seems like there are many places where you have to have fiscal, it's, it seems, it feels like barriers to entry fiscal sponsors, create your own 501, membership fees. By the way, I'd, I'd be interested, I've always wondered, I love the presentations that you guys do, I've always wondered what percentage of people get more money from grants that they get through your organization than they pay in membership fees. But, but, but you know, all of these are, feel like barriers to entry. And yeah. Sorry, just one thing I'll say about the fiscal sponsorship thing is that we've also seen an increase of entities that will offer fiscal sponsorship. It's not free, and you know it, it comes with its own issues. But um, you know that is a growing uh, realm of the field as well to accommodate the kind of ways that people are making work less, um, you know, le less bricks and mortar. So, so you know, my personal experience, for example, the last thing I put work into applying to was not something any of you are doing. It's jazz.next. And when I didn't get the grant and I spoke to them, they said, oh, well, you had the highest rated uh, application that didn't get money. And, and in the other category, guys, my friend Dave Douglas had the highest rated application that didn't get money. But every single person that got money in the first round was like Berkeley School. I mean, it was huge organizations that have loads of money. Individuals, not a single individual got anything. So what it's- What was the grant making organization? Well, with jazz.next. Oh, yeah. So. Anyway, but, but, but thank you for all the things you're doing, but I hope there's some way, I, I assume that, that, for example, National Endowment not dealing with individuals is nothing that you have any control of, I'm, I'm assuming it's, but I mean, as much as it's possible for any of you to lower the barriers of entry, to me, that's a positive thing. Yeah, so, certainly. Uh, uh, you can come to New Music USA's uh, project grants. We definitely uh, uh, accept individual applications. Uh, we've tried to, we used to have basically well, we had at one time 12 different programs uh, and we merged sort of five programs together into this project grants to do exactly that, to, to remove the boxes and to, to sort of try to make it all in one thing. So, so that you come to us and you talk to us like you, you're an artist and you're talking about your art. Um, and we got rid of the, the need for a 501c3 or a 
uh, fiscal sponsor, things like that, so that we could be responsive to the field because the field is changing. It, it feels that way. I, I, see, I feel that. So, you know, we want to be responsive and we want to be able to, uh, you know, fund work that's happening now, not work that, you know, really kind of happened a little while ago. So, and, and I suggest to really check out the, the state, the regional and local arts agencies because they are, they can support support individual artists more. I mean, our grants are in the realm of like 10,000, maybe like $100,000, but $100,000 that might be more the funding for a service organization for their annual conference or for programs that benefit many, many artists. Now, there's one um, grant program that I did not mention yet, and that's called US Artists International. And that is administered by Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation out of Baltimore on behalf of the Arts Endowment. And um, that's for individual artists in different disciplines in theater, visual arts, um, dance, and, and music. And all you need to apply is an invitation from a festival abroad. They have, I think, two or three deadlines per year. So that's an opportunity if there's a festival anywhere in the world that's interested in, in hosting you, but there's no funds for travel, um, look into that. But Rory, uh were you asking, did you want me to answer that question about CMA? No, that's, a, I mean, it is about discussing these things and um, you call it a barrier to entry and I understand that. Um, and, but is the glass half full or is it half empty? Is it the cost of entry? Is there a cost? Um, CMA is built on this membership model different, these organizations are all differently funded. And, and so the membership for an ensemble is $125 a year. CMA would say, it's not only to apply for a grant, it's to take advantage of the many different things that CMA has to offer. That's what CMA would say. And how many grantees are awarded in New Jazz Works each year? Nine to 10 how much money, like this year, last year we received 208 applications and we awarded nine. And that gave away something like $200,000, right? Um, and so this year we received 198 applications and we have the same amount of money. It could be for more ensembles if they're smaller or if, if there are larger ensembles, it'd probably be closer to nine. So that's in the um, ensemble area. There are presenters as well. Okay. Uh, who who join to a who join and apply? There are other ensembles that join but don't apply. Not all ensembles apply. Some, but many of the jazz ensembles that join join to apply. The classical ensembles function a little differently. They apply, there's more jazz ensembles that apply than classical ensembles that apply. But they're diff it's a different name. Sure. 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 Hi, I'm Colin Dean. Uh, I'm a bassist, composer, music director, alumni of the jazz program here. Um, I had a question is uh, based on something that was raised a few times briefly in this conversation. Um, how do your organizations approach proposals that do, or compositions that do incorporate non-idiomatic elements? So say for instance, I'm applying for, you know, a, a jazz oriented grant, but you know, in, in reality, you know, I'm working with global hip hop artists, I'm incorporating world music, and I'm also rooting it in jazz because I don't know for me and my generation, this is the reality, you know, it's, uh, there's no real separation in those different styles anymore. You know, what I call jazz is not necessarily what, you know, our mentors do, you know? That's um, for the arts endowment, that, that's fine. If an organization does that, um, I, I would suggest to, to call us the specialists in um, the music discipline or multidisciplinary because you wanna be sure that you apply in the right discipline. Now with jazz specifically, it, it always was understood that elements of poetry and dance are part of jazz nevertheless. So that was not because it goes together and always did traditionally. So that doesn't make a work um, multidisciplinary. But um, you can call and, and we'll give you our best um, you know, impression of 
grants and, and you can also actually we have a grant search feature on arts.gov recent grants so look for similar projects and see in what discipline the organizations applied and see if that gives you an idea of for your project that sounds like a perfect map project that by the way you should come to map yeah we're, we're definitely funding uh more uh undefinable works as well so we try to make sure that the panel that we have is diverse enough to to handle that kind of diverse project as well and for us the music continues to grow music is not dead what might be jazz for the person sitting next to you is different from the person sitting on the other side. It is up to the panel. And so then the next question you should say, well, who chooses the panel, right? Uh, and we try to get that panel to be representative within five people. And um, we have funded projects that include rap artists. It needs to be musicians because we're funded for music. And it is up to the panel to say, uh, this fits, this is what we, we think is outstanding. Um, and, uh, and Scott touched upon some of that stuff as being, you know, there's certain qualities, he's used the word fresh. Uh, uh, so, um, but uh, for CMA this year, they have, it has expanded. So fresh could mean traditional it could mean old time it doesn't have to be um cutting edge so fresh has a very broad you know cma wouldn't use the word fresh but anyhow um, hello my name is francina connors and i'm a i've written grants and um thank people that for funding us for different projects but i had a question about um let's say getting comments on your grants when you don't receive a grant. And a couple of times I've spoken with you, Jeanette, and it's been very useful in helping me tweak the next grants or just helping me organize my material. Can you comment on that? We, we love to give um, panel feedback, both to organizations that are successful and to unsuccessful ones. Because even successful ones that might have received grants, luckily for them, each year for like 10 years, may not know that there may be one application cycle away from not being funded because their application has become formulaic for a similar or identical project like if it's a festival for example and the application itself never changed whereas our artistic merit and artistic excellence um, guide, um, criteria were adjusted to include for example projects that address um, the arts and technology and sciences and then innovation. Now, innovation is a is a term that maybe um, can be stretched in, in either, either direction too, and um, is a fashion term. But uh, it's I think it's very important to get that panel feedback. Uh, and one thing that I realized, for example, in applications that come in each year for different artists but are formulaic, um, the audiences, virtual audiences and components of, for example, live web streaming or web Q and A's, a lot of times were not added. And there's a lost opportunity for virtual audiences around the globe that would tremendously expand the impact of a project that is not touched upon. I so think we love to do that. Yeah, I think it's very, very important. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's it's something we encourage um, everyone to do. If you're not funded, definitely ask for feedback and apply again. It's very important. What we found, uh, we're we're just past the third round, going into our fourth round of this new project grants. But what we found is that uh, in the over the last couple of rounds. Um, about 30% of those that we award are projects that had come to us in a previous round that were not funded. And they've come back to us, asked us for feedback, we've talked to them about their projects, and then they've ha submitted successful projects. So it's, it's very important to get that feedback to understand where you might be falling short, where you might not be meeting those criteria. Uh, was it your work samples? Was it your narrative? Was it something else? Um, it's very important to get, to get that. And it'll help you grow as a grant and well a grant writer or, or a funding ser funding searching person i'm not sure right way to say it but whatever if as you're looking for funding it'll help you grow it, you'll learn a lot and it's a very it's a very valuable thing to do so definitely do that just to give you an idea last um last round um 
the 208 applications. So there were like 198 or 99 uh, folks that didn't get the grant. We, I gave feedback to 60% of that. So yes, the jazz musicians, you guys call and want the feedback. You are educated shoppers. You do diligence, do you know? And uh, so I, I give you credit. You take the time. No question here. Hi, my name is Jimmy Owens. I'm a jazz artist and I'm on the faculty of the new school. And I'm a NEA Jazz Master class of 2012. I just want to make comment on, um, give you a little historic perspective from my experience. I have been involved with funding in the arts since 1969. Uh, establishment of one of the many jazz organizations that later got funded by NEA and then NISCA and whatnot. When we deal with 501c3, the jazz organization, I will deal from 1969, the collective black artists, and at that time, jazz mobile, jazz interactions, the international art of jazz, all jazz organizations in New York that were 501c3, they had tremendous problems, one, forming a very good board, finding the correct kinds of people, okay? Those people who were excellent on boards were on the classical side. They were on all of the organizations. The jazz organization found it very difficult to find those people. They found it very difficult to get funding outside of NEA or NISCA, okay? Banks, I mean, Reggie Workman and I worked with the collective black artists in 1969, straight through 1976. Banks, when they would give us money, were talking about giving us $250. Now, $250 is fine, but you know, we were putting in for a program that cost $15,000. So these were the problems that were being faced by the jazz organization, the 501c3. And one by one, they died. And Billy Taylor managed to keep Jazz Mobile alive and funded very well. When he left Jazz Mobile, it started to get shaky. And the other organizations are no longer in existence. Now, my question is, um, what does the artist do who is putting in a work sample, who wants to write a work for orchestra, capable of doing that, but has no material that is recent? I know many, many artists like that. They have no work that is recent, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and they could send that work. And it sounds good in this day and age. But when one of the administrators or the panelists question, well, this work was written in 1970, 75. What does he or she have that is more recent? Well, they may not have anything that shows that they're capable of writing for orchestra. And like you say, to send a quintet information and you want to write for orchestra is something that will not get funded. It it's, it's depends. I mean, there, there, we have had, it's, it's not a, a strict rule. You know, you submit the best work samples that you have that make sense within the project. Um, and that's the best that you can do. Uh, if you have a large ensemble work, that's what we usually encourage people to, to submit. If they don't have a large ensemble work, then they submit the best work that they have. It's not a hard and fast rule in terms of how the panel approaches it. They're gonna approach the work sample for its merit, um, especially in our first round stage. They have some concept of what the project is, but they're really listening to the work sample itself. It's usually later in the air, in the stage where they, they, they get a the chance to look, look through the narrative and understand 
where that's coming from and get the perspective of that. That's that's a very important thing. And using the narrative to your advantage or the description, if there's a work sample description, to explain and talk about why this work, why you chose this particular work. I think it's important to take a moment to, to tell people why you chose that work and why it's relevant to what you're hoping to do uh, wherever you have a chance. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just suggestions. Um. Uh, for Chamber Music America, of course, it's a it's a project that's for two to ten musicians. Yeah, and but just uh, to um, it, we used to have a rule that the work sample could only be five years back, but we got rid of that, and so it opens it up. Yeah, we um, used to have the same rule, and we got rid of it too. But. Yeah, and the but the and I think you've heard it from us a lot is. If you find yourself thinking, you wanting to make that kind of app, make an application and you think this program fits pretty well, give us a call, talk to us about it. Because, you know, uh, uh, if it makes sense, if it fits, uh, we would encourage you to apply. Thank you. Have a Hi, my name is Amanda. I have a question that might be parallel to what Mr. Owens was saying. And it's related to expanding what um, Scott was saying uh, about, and this is something that's so common with jazz artists. We want to apply for funding for an upcoming group of musicians to collaborate and make create music together. But there's no sample of the work because the work hasn't existed yet because there hasn't been any funding. So then you said well maybe you can submit a few samples of recordings of some of the members together but what what uh, some of your panelists might think it would be best to present individual works of individual members and explain how these people would sound would sound and how would that benefit uh, the society or whatever the goal of the grant is or just to record a demo that doesn't sound that good, but with all the collective together. Like, how do you think an artist in a situation like that would present a stronger case towards winning the grant? Uh, so I'll just speak for them from MAP. Um, first of all, MAP allows um, two samples per artist. So you have, and you can have up to three lead artists on a project. So you have a fair amount of space there to, um, you know, illustrate the work of the individuals within the group. Um, I would, again, to what Scott was saying, use the work sample description field to very, very explicitly link the dots between, or link the whatever, between the sample work itself and the proposed work. I mean, like at 2.57, you will hear the trombone do da da da. And that, that is the idea. Like, you don't <laughs> think you're being too obvious or explicit for the panel. They really need you to connect the dots in that way. The other thing is sort of the flip side of what you're saying. And this is, um, you know, all of these programs are highly competitive. So it's possible that the work that you are trying to create is not ready for funding at this level. I don't say that in any way to be discouraging, but to say that um, it's possible that when you're building something brand new, you need to, to fi figure out crowdsourcing or you need to figure out some sort of funding um, to build it up to the level where you do have even a, a highly um, attractive demo to begin to compete at this level. It's not to discourage you at all, but to say that, that it could be a factor depending on where you're at with it. Yeah, it's it, it is tough when you're trying to project what the project might be and it hasn't been realized. We get this a lot with new work is like, how do I how do I, uh, you know, accurately present what I'm trying to do? You a lot of our programs allow space for multiple work samples and use those use as much as you can. If you have opportunities to submit work samples for your colleagues, do that. Our program definitely does. You can have uh, colleagues, they can have their own profile with their own work samples that demonstrate their quality. So you want to think about what is the best work sample that I can submit that, you know, demonstrates my work? Is this, you know, my work? What can I do that has some relevance to the project, even if it's not exactly somehow? And then connect those dots, like, like you know, definitely connect the dots. I think that's very important. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about, uh, Amanda, and Amanda, hi. Um, is that 
if if that project were to come to CMA, I would tell you, is it for two to ten musicians? You say yes. Okay. So one way of handling it is to say, because this is what CMA allows, is that you might have a core band, that's a quintet, that has a recording, and then you want to add musicians as guests to it. We don't require recordings of the guests. That works for us. Other grant programs work so that you're getting the grant as the composer and you get to put the project together. We support the ensemble first. And then Mora supports a multidisciplinary project, which is very exciting. Yeah, there, there are different approaches for the different things. And I think that's a good way of putting it is, is Ian, definitely talk to us about it. Say, I'm, I'm kind of in this conundrum. What do I do? How do I best demonstrate what we're trying to get across here? And, and we'll do our best to help you even listening to work samples or, or going over it. I mean, so definitely I understand that. But, you know, we're here to help. OK, uh, I think we have one, one final question and uh, we're going to wrap it up. Hi, my name is Avram Pfeffer, uh, saxophone player, composer, etc. Um, I have actually two questions. One small one that I think is just very kind of logistic, based on the work sample. Um, so, if you know, you said that it's kind of a, a, a much less than we'd like to have you listen to. But um, so, is it something where if you haven't said exactly, you know, s specific points within a two and a half or five minute piece? to listen to, will you either because you like or don't like a piece, jump forward to see if it, you know, like how does that work within the panel? It depends. And my second question, just to put it out there, was directly actually to Rob, if he's still there. Um, but uh, uh, after you addressed that, I just wondered, because Rob referred to the fact that he wanted to be part of, Rob, I'm talking to you, baby, um, <laughs> that he wanted to be a, address things kind of outside of the jazz business model. And I was kind of curious if you had talked about that or maybe we just need to have a beer. Thanks. <laughs> the the panel will will approach if you don't if you don't specify where to start, usually they'll start at the beginning um, and they'll often move forward. Uh, it depends on the type of panel process. If it's an in-person panel, usually uh, they'll start at the beginning and the panel has the ability to say, well, can we jump ahead and hear where that's going? or I've had enough or whatever. I mean, they'll, they'll decide how they want to handle it based on what they're hearing. Um, usually if they're starting with, I mean, it depends on if it's an in-person or if, if someone's listening on their own, they, they have that choice. There is that flexibility to kind of move around if they want to hear another part of it as well. And we encourage that as much as possible. Uh, um, they're all in the room and um, they've been listening to five minutes for three days straight. And so they get to application 199 and there's cue timings you give. And they'll say, Jeanette, go here. Oh, it says there's a saxophone solo, I wanna hear it. Oh, okay, I'm done with that, let's go to the next one. And someone says, wait, I wanna go back and listen to it again, I didn't hear enough. Okay, and I say, well, you got one more minute, where do you wanna go to the next track? It's kinda like that, moves quickly. It's a give and take you know, between the panel usually in terms of how they wanna approach each, each uh, work sample, so. Uh, I mean, so it, different different organizations handle the the panel process differently. Some have only individual listening. Some have group listening. So it just depends on the organization. So I know CMA does their group. We do uh, individual. NEA I think does individual. Uh, or, yes. Yeah, and so. and actually, we used to have in person panels and move to um, at home review and teleconference or video uh, conference panels about two years ago. So. The panelists listen to all the work samples on their own time in whatever way they want to. And then the panel discussion does not involve the listening to work samples anymore. Yeah. But that's the one thing that I was trying to remember to say before is get to know what the panel process is for each one of the different grants. And it usually is stated in the grant guidelines. But if you don't see it and you want to email or to find out, you say, it's just like when you go into a doctor, you know, you, you ask, well, can you tell me what the panel process is? Because that helps you understand how to put the grant application together. Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, I just want to quickly say that that uh, in this this handout that I put together, um, obviously explains the mission and the grants available from the the four organizations that the that we have representatives up here tonight, and a, a smattering of about eight to ten, and that's just a start. There are literally hundreds of organizations in the United States who uh, uh, who who fund people of every race, ethnicity, and gender. And, and you, should, you should seek them out. So this is, like I said, this is just a start. Um, so, um, and, and again, I, myself, and I, I think I can speak for the panelists, are always open to questions. Can I just say one thing? Yes. I, I always feel at these panels like, I wanna say, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry that it's so hard. I mean, if you knew how much respect and admiration certainly myself and all of us and our panelists who are your peers have and the you know the degree of i was just sitting here thinking like if i was in your place and i'd spent the last 20 years like studying jazz piano and um so but i studied grant making and then there was a, a panel of jazz pianists up here telling me how to do my grant making better i would be like i don't know like there's too much detail like i'm so sorry that you have to go through this um but i think it's worth it in the end and i think it gets at what rob is i think trying to say bringing these panels together like there is one model for funding your work which is maybe gigging in the club and, and um you know recording and stuff and there is this other model and it's available to you if you have the patience to kind of go through all of the detail of each different organization so we are here for you for that excellent thank you very much so so i'd like to thank mark Mueller and and his staff here at the at the new school thank you very much and thank you once again katja von schutenbach jeanette wokalo scott winship and Maura Brennan, um, thanks very much. Thank you. And there, there's going to be some refreshments here for us if you'd like to hang out and talk to any of us or, or mill around or do anything. Well, I have a little bit of lighting bridge and cheese to continue the conversation. Really happy that you're here. And especially just thanks to the 